Matthew chapter 8, I want to preach a message I'm entitled, Willing and Able. Willing and Able. And I'm believing that before this service is over, God is going to touch people at their point of need. I don't know what need you brought with you today. You may not have brought a need. Wonderful. Enjoy the reprieve. Enjoy the lull. Enjoy the good times. Because if you keep living, something will come along. But if you came this morning with a need, maybe it's something that's popped up recently or maybe it's something that's chronic that you've lived with for a long, long time, it doesn't matter. I know God can meet you at your point of need. And I really believe that before this service is over today, God is going to touch some people and God's going to meet you at your point of need. It's going to be life-changing for you. I think we're going to find the direction in the Word of God. So in Matthew chapter 8, I want to, I want to read verses 1 through 4. And if you don't have a Bible, it's on the screen. If you do, keep your Bible open because I'm going to preach right out of this text. When Jesus had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Then Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one, but go, go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. You can be seated this morning. Thank you for reverence in the word of God. So I'm just going to jump right into this story. When this story occurs, Jesus has just completed the Sermon on the Mount. And he's come down off of the mountain, and when he reaches the bottom of the mountain, he is met by a leper. Now, in the Bible, the word leprosy is sort of a generic term. It can mean anything as simple psoriasis to the true disease of leprosy. And From all indications, this man seemed to have the true disease of leprosy. And its symptoms ranged from white patches on the skin to running sores to even the loss of digits, fingers and toes. Now for the Hebrews, leprosy was a dreaded disease that rendered its victims ceremonially unclean. This is very important. And and what did that do? That meant that they were unfit to worship God in the temple. They were also disqualified to interact with the rest of society. So because anyone who came in contact with a leper would also be considered unclean, lepers were isolated from the rest of the community. Now I want you to understand that because it makes this story fascinating. This leper defies societal norms and the religious restraints of the law and he makes his way to Jesus. He comes into a crowd of people and approaches Jesus. In my imagination, which is incredibly vivid, I see people scattering every which direction but one, Jesus. People are running for their lives. Get away from that man. Get away from him. If you touch him, you'll be unclean. He shouldn't be here. I see maybe one or two picking up stones because they want to throw a stone at this guy because he's not supposed to do what he is doing. But when you read the text, and we read it just a minute ago, I don't know about you, but I think you can feel his desperation. And I think you can sense his determination in coming to Jesus. He doesn't matter if what he is doing is scandalous. He doesn't matter if what he is doing is breaking the societal norms. None of that matters to him. He's got a need, and he knows Jesus can meet his need, and he's desperate, and he's determined to get to the Lord. Let me just stop right here and say to you, things haven't changed in 2,000 years. I have learned that if you've got a need in your life, that a lot of times it takes desperation and determination to get an answer to your prayer. I think the Lord looks at our heart and he looks at our attitude. And I know desperate people don't give up. Desperate people say, I'm not going to quit. Determined people say, I'm not going to pray one time. And if the Lord doesn't answer my prayer, just say, oh, well, shrug my shoulders and walk away. But determined, desperate people say, God, I'm not going to let go 
more of you until you bless me. I'm not going to, I'm going to keep on asking. I'm going to keep on seeking. I'm going to keep on pounding on the door and knocking until I get my prayer. That's exactly what this man did. And, and he not only came with desperation and determination, but you saw it there. You, you, you saw it on the screen. This man came with acts of faith, very simple acts. They're acts that we perform. They're acts that we can identify with. The first one is we would say that he prayed. It doesn't say in the text that he prayed, but it did say that he implored the Lord repeatedly, with, had a request with a serious request. That's prayer. The second thing he did is that he worshiped. And I looked up that word Jesus, and it means that he fell on his knees with his face to the ground in an act of obeisance, acknowledging that Jesus is the superior one. And furthermore, that word means that he adored Jesus. That means he gazed upon him. He had his head down, but when he did lift it up, he looked on him with love and admiration and devotion. And here's what he said in his prayer. Lord, if you're willing, if you want to, I know you can make me clean. I, I, I'm going to just expand on that, okay? He said, that, that, here's what that man was saying. I'm going to add to it. I'm going I'm to help you understand. Get the feel of this. He was saying, Jesus, you are Lord. You are God. You're in control. You have all power. And you can do anything. Nothing is too hard for you. And Jesus, you know what's best for me, and I trust you. All you have to do is just choose to touch me. All you have to do is make a decision on my behalf, and when you do, things are going to change in my life. Something wonderful is going to happen to me. My prayer, my request to you will be answered. And Jesus... I know that you just don't have ability to do anything. You have the ability to heal me of this disease. Where others have failed, you will not fail me. Where others have disappointed me, you will not disappoint me. This isn't too hard for you, Jesus. I know that you are able. Can you feel that and sense that? I believe that's exactly what's happening. Well, can I just take that moment and transfer it into our moment and tell you something that ought to help you today? When you come to Jesus in desperation and when you come to Jesus with determination, you need to come to him in worship and you need to come to him with simple, heartfelt prayer and you need to come with faith and you need to do just like the leper. It's still the same. You need to say, "You're Jesus, you're the Lord. You're God. You're not just some doctor in a hospital. You're not just some lawyer, an attorney in an office somewhere. You're not just some banker in a bank that told me no. You're not just anybody, but you are the Lord of lords, and you're the King of kings, and you're my God, and you're my king, and you're my sovereign, and there's nothing too hard for you. You're God. You've never failed. You can do anything but fail, and Lord, I'm coming to you right now, and I know that you know what's best for me, and I trust you 110%. I know that whatever decision you make will be the best decision for me, but that's the point, Jesus. I know that if you could just make one decision, I know you probably have a zillion decisions to make for a billion, billions of people in this world, but Lord, here I am, and I just need you to make one simple decision, and if you'll decide on my behalf, I know something good is about to take place in my life, and then you say, Lord, you can handle my mountain. You can handle my problem. You can heal my body. You can straighten out my finances. You can restore my marriage. You can touch my kids and bring them back home because you have the power, Lord. That's how you come to Jesus when you pray. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's how this man came. And let me just ask you something. Let me just ask you if you've seen anything. Did anyone notice, and I'm sure for those of you who read the Bible, you've never, it's not like this is the first time you've been exposed to this story, but just did anybody even notice, some, some people see things, that the leper did not say, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me whole. That's not what he said. He said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Now, you need to notice that. 
Well, you say, well, did he want to be healed? Absolutely he wanted to be healed. But he wanted more. Sometimes we pray for things that on the surface it seems like we just have a simple request and we'd like a simple answer. But if you dig down a little beneath our circumstance and get us to be honest, sometimes there's more to it. There's more to it. There, there are all these sub-levels of consequences and causes and effects and we've been living in it. And we know that if, if God can just take care of this one thing, then there'll be a domino effect and all these other situations will be resolved and God will move that out of my life. It's kind of the same way here. Yes, he wanted to be, he wanted to be healed, but you got to remember, and that's why I told you what I did early on in the message, that he was ceremonially unclean. He was socially unclean. And he wanted to be clean, not just, not just healed. He wanted to be restored in fellowship with God. He wanted to be able to go back to church. It's amazing. People will miss church for all kinds of the wrong reasons. But boy, if you ever have to miss church because... You can't help it. You're sick or you're going through a crisis and it keeps you out. It's amazing. Those people say to me, I miss church so bad. I can't wait till I can go back to church. I can't wait till I can get back to the house of God. You know, we take church for granted, don't we? We need to stop doing that, don't we? And I'm just preaching straight here this morning. This man said, I haven't been able to go to church in a long, long, long time. I want to get back to church. I want to get back to the house of God. I want to worship with the saints. I want to get with my family. I want to go back to work and be part of society. Listen to me. He wanted a restoration of what was lost. I'm going to tell you, you say, when will you get desperate? You'll get desperate when you're tired of living in loss. You'll, You'll get determined when you say, God, it's been long enough. It's been long enough. I don't ever recommend getting mad and fussing at God. People have done it, and God can handle it, but I don't recommend that. That's not the best way to come. But I'll tell you what, when you get a little fire in your voice, little little, little, little saltiness when you come to the Lord, you, you're still loving him and respecting him, y'all, because he's God. But there's all, it's all right to come to him, and he knows this has nothing to do with you, Lord. My God, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost. I'm trying to behave. This, this has nothing to do with you, Lord. Do You know everything. So you know this chippiness in me, God, has nothing to do with you because you're the only answer. But, Lord, I'm sick and tired of this. I'm sick and tired of being sick. I'm sick and tired of my marriage struggling. I'm sick and tired of my kids living in sin and being away from God. My husband not serving the Lord. My wife not serving the Lord. I'm sick and tired of going through this struggle and this trial and this difference. God, I'm tired of it. You get a little chippiness in your voice. I think the Lord likes that. I think the Lord likes it. Would you say, God, I'm tired of things being like this. I'm ready for the God of restoration to step into my situation and turn things around. Give me back what the devil's taken from me. Give me back what sin has taken from me. God, even give me back what my my own bad debt decisions has taken from me. Give it back to me, Lord. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. He wanted restoration He was tired of yelling, unclean, unclean. That's what he had to do. Anytime anybody got close to him, maybe they weren't paying attention that he was a leper. His responsibility was to yell, hey, hey, unclean, unclean, get away from me. How, what kind of life would that be to live? He was tired of it. He, he wanted, he didn't want to do that. He wanted something to happen where when somebody came around and they kind of looked up for a minute and they might say, wait, 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 wait a minute, that's the guy who was a leper. He said, oh, no, 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 I used to be that guy. I used to be that guy, but I'm not that guy anymore. I met, my God, I met somebody and he changed my circumstance. I'm clean. Come look, I'm clean. My God, anybody remember the day when you came to Jesus and all you could ever say is unclean, unclean, and everybody knew how dirty you were, how sinful you were, but you got in the altar and you said, Lord, I don't disagree. I'm unclean, but I need your touch. And the Lord touched you and washed you and saved you. And then you got up and when people said, are you still a sinner? No, I met Jesus and he changed me. I'm clean now. Anybody remember that? Woo! Look at somebody if you're saved and say, I'm clean. I'm clean. I'm clean. That's what he wanted. 
And so Jesus hears his request. And the suspension, suspension rises in this story. The suspensefulness rises. What's Jesus going to do? And the Lord looks at this leper. Everybody's run. Maybe they're all standing watching the Lord. What are you doing? Get away from him. And the Lord just stands there. And he says three words. I I am willing. I want to do this. I want to do this. And son, I'm I'm can, can I be southern? I am. And I'm fixing to do this. Now, I don't know if the Lord ever said fixing, but he did just then. Why would Jesus be willing to touch him? Why would Jesus be willing to touch you? Why? Oh, we could come up with all kinds of reasons. But let me just give you two. He knows what's best for you. That's why he'll touch you. He knows what's best. He can see the future. He can see the consequences of his actions. He knows the cause and effect, the ramifications. He knows what's best. But listen to me. You got to get this. It's not just that he knows. Listen to me. I'm, I'm telling you, this, this is just what I know about Jesus. He wants what's best for you. That ought to make you happy. Thank God he wants what's best for us. Jesus cares about you. He really does, more than you'll ever know. When he looks, just get this, when he looks at you, and especially when you're in a dire situation, the Lord's heart is moved with compassion for you. Now, let's just deal with something, okay? Just because Jesus was willing in this circumstance for this man does not mean that Jesus is always willing. We need to just preach it, okay? God is not a giant vending machine. And I pop in a coin called prayer, and I pull a handle, say a few spiritual phrases, and boop, out comes my answer every time. No, God is a person and a divine being. And so sometimes God says no. And you have to accept his decision, his will. It takes mature faith to do this. And you have to learn how not to grow bitter or not to turn your back on God. Because you have to remember, God knows what's best. And if you say, well, I don't like that. Well, are you better than Jesus? No. When Jesus was the God-man... He was in a garden talking to God, praying. And he said, Lord or Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to go through this. My flesh doesn't go through this. Yes, the divine being knew what needed. The divine part of him, the nature, we should say. The divine nature knew, but the human nature recoiled from crucifixion and death. Father, if you're willing, let this cup pass from me. And what if God always said yes? You'd still be in your sins today. Am I right? You'd still be in your sins today. So sometimes you may not understand it. This is helping somebody right now. I feel this in the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you don't understand it, but sometimes the best thing God can do is to tell you no. And the best thing you can do is do like Jesus, who said, nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want, and let that be done. Because you might have to go through hell, but you won't have to go long. It'll always get you back to heaven. Sometimes he'll bring you out and sometimes he'll take you through, but he'll walk every step of the way. As a matter of fact, he'll go before you. Because, yea, even, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And your rod and your staff will comfort me. And a valley, you get to the other side, and when you walk through it, you're back up on the mountain again. 
So sometimes he says no, and you've got to embrace that and say, okay, God, I still trust you. I'll still serve you. Job said, though he slay me himself, I'll still serve him and I'll still trust him. That's mature faith. But y'all, a lot of times, he says yes. And so what is your job? Your job is to pray. Your job is to believe. And then your job is to leave the rest up to God. And I'm not going to re-preach my sermon from last week, my message, but you need to leave the timing up to God and leave the means up to God. Don't help him. You'll make a mess. Have y'all ever tried to help mama or grandma in the kitchen and she finally said, just get out? Y'all ever had that happen? Grandma, you ever done that? Y'all just get out. You're getting in my way. Okay, that's what we do. Don't get in God's kitchen. Stay out of the kitchen. Let God work. And he'll take care of everything. Hallelujah. So Jesus looked at that man and said, I'm willing. I want to do this. And then Jesus did the most scandalous thing. The crowd gasped. (gasps) One or two said, don't. He reached out his hand. And he touched him. Could you imagine what was going on in that crowd? He touched him. And in some of their minds, they said, oh, no. The power of the leprosy has now tainted him. He's unclean. He's affected. But you must not know God very well. Because there ain't nothing on this earth that has the power to affect him and do something negative to him, not once, because he's God. When he touches you, it doesn't affect him, it affects you. It always goes in one direction in the cause and the effect, and he broke societal norms, and he did what was going to be printed in the papers the next day. He reached out and touched the leper. You know what that touch said to that man? That touch said, I'm concerned about you. That touch said, I care about you. I, I was thinking maybe this man had not been physically touched by an individual for years. Could you imagine living that kind of life? And then he feels the strong, rugged hand of the, of the carpenter from Nazareth reaching over and touching him, putting his hand on his shoulder. Maybe say, I don't know if he touched the cloth or I don't even know if he just put his hand on the white patchy skin. I don't know. I don't think it mattered to Jesus. But he put his hand on it and it said, I love you and I'm concerned about you and I care for you. But here's the other reason he touched him. He touched him so that in his hand, through his touch it could be a conduit through which supernatural power could flow and I want y'all to get this Jesus touched that man and when he did the healing virtue of power came through and touched the molecules on the skin of that man and it spread like wildfire and in an instant every white patchy spot was gone whatever digits were lost or restored anything that looked like or resembled the symptoms of leprosy were eradicated and that man was not only whole but he was cleansed and restored and everything was right between him and God once again <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I just got to preach a while can I preach listen he's still touching people today he's still touching people today and he doesn't care who you are and he doesn't care what you're in and if you're a sinner he doesn't care how dirty you are you say Jesus would never touch me I'm a sinner I'm a rebel I've done so much wrong let me tell you something if you'll come to him with a humble heart and you say I need you to do something in my life he'll reach out and touch you and when he touches you it will make all the difference in the world if you're sick and he touches you, it'll heal you. If, if, if you're broken in your heart and he touches you, your heart will be made whole. If, you, if, you're, if you're rattled in your nerves and he touches you, he'll give you a sound mind. If your finances are in bad shape and he touches you, he can give you a financial miracle. I, I, if your marriage is on the rocks, he can come in and pull you up off the rocks and put you on solid ground and, a, and restore what has been broken and lost. All it takes is just one touch of the master's hand 
Thank God for counseling. I'm all for counselors, but sometimes all you need is a touch. Thank God for medication, and we need it, but sometimes all you need is a touch. Sometimes you need to go to a psychotherapist or a marriage counselor. Thank God for it, but sometimes all it takes is a touch. Thank God for doctors and medical science and and all the equipment that's there. Thank God for all of it, but sometimes all you need is just the touch of Jesus. Y'all, he can do more in five seconds than people can do in five minutes, five hours, five days, five weeks, or five years. Because of his power, he touched that man and he healed him. I just want you to believe today that God can touch you. Sometimes the best thing to do, maybe that's what some of you need to do when we get in these altars in just a minute. Maybe what some of you need to do is come down here. Close your eyes and lift your hands and begin to pray and tell God what you need in desperation, determination. And then just imagine. That's why I think it's good that we Pentecostals lay hands on people. I like it. Because sometimes his touch works through our touch. So you Pentecostals sure like to lay hands on people. That's right. You know why? Because we have the faith to believe that God's power. I, I some, a lot of times I think it's, I lay my hand on somebody's head, somebody's head, and I'm just imagining Jesus taking his hand and laying it on top of mine and saying, hold it right there, son. I'm going to flow through your hand into their body, and we're going to do something right here. I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it through you, but you just let me, let me work. And I'm just sitting here saying, God, just flow. Just flow through my hand. Let the anointing flow. How many know the anointing makes the difference? The anointing destroys the yoke. The anointing sets the captive free. It's the anointing that makes all the difference in the world. That's why we lay hands. The, the old song said, oh, to be his hand extended, reaching out to the oppressed. Let me touch him. Let me touch Jesus so that others may know and be blessed. Sometimes he can touch through us. And God healed that man. I don't know what happened then. I'm going to preach the rest of the conversation. I don't know if the crowd just, they saw it. There were plenty of witnesses. Maybe a few started easing up, wanting to get a closer look. You know, rubberneckers. <laughs> and he, he, he trying to see something different about him. Something's changed. He's not the same. The Lord still ignored the crowd, and he gave him a directive. And I'm going to show you something, and I want you to get this. Jesus gave him more than a miracle. He gave him a testimony. When God does something for you, he gives you more than the answer to your prayer. He gives you a story to share. And and it's interesting to me. He, He says to the man, now listen to me. Don't go talk to anybody else. I know you want to. I know you want to go home and tell your wife. I know you want to go home and tell your mom and dad. I know you want to go see your kids. I know you want to go back to your hometown and tell all your friends. I know what's beating inside of you, but listen to me. Listen, it's not what you're going to do. Go to the priest as the law of Moses commanded and show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifice. As a, Listen to this. He said, as a testimony to them. You're going to have plenty of time to testify to everybody else, but I need you to go to the priest. See, the priest had gotten away from God, a lot of them, not all of them. You had priests like Zechariah, who was the father of John the Baptist, who were godly men. But many of them have got, had gotten away from God. They were just living and going through the motions. Isn't it sad when a preacher just goes through the motions? I don't ever want to be that kind of preacher. And he said, I need you to go show them the power of God in you. It starts at the top. We need to affect the spiritual leaders of this nation. Now, I'm going to share some things with you. You may not know. This is really fascinating as I come to a close. The command that he has given the leper, now former leper, is found in the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, the third book of the Bible, chapter 14. Literally, 
half the chapter, verses 1 through 32. And I'm going to show you something here that's cool. The Old Testament sometimes can bog you down, but I'm going to show you something that's powerful because the Old Testament is filled with symbols and types and representations of things that we now know as reality in the New Testament. Y'all with me? All right, so stay with me. So Jesus says, go back and offer the gift, offer the sacrifice according to the law of Moses. This is Leviticus 14. So I'm going to tell you, here's what, here's what he was supposed to do. He goes back to the priest, and, the, and he walks up to the priest, and he says, I had leprosy, but I'm clean. The priest said, okay, strip down, I have to examine you. And like a doctor, he examines the individual. He will look for the white patches of skin, for white hair, anything that would be symptoms or indications of leprosy. This man had none. God had healed him. And when the priest examined him from head to toe, this is what is supposed to happen. He said, okay, wait right here. And they would get a bird. Does it say what kind of bird? It may have been a pigeon, a dove. But they took a bird. I'm gonna, I could read it to you, but it's there. If you want to go to Leviticus, read it for yourself. But I'm going to preach it to you for the sake of time. They took a live bird and put it in a clay pot. One, one priest would hold the pot. Another priest or maybe a Levite would take a pitcher of water and, or, a, or a pot of water and pour running water over top of the bird inside the clay pot. And then a third priest would kill the bird. Okay? That's the first thing that would happen. And, of course, it would be blood would flow. Watch this. Blood and water would flow. Anybody, anybody, does that sound familiar to anybody? Okay, so you say, that's cr- why, would you, why would you go to church? And the preacher puts a live bird in a clay pot, and some other preacher pours water over it, and then the third preacher kills the bird in the pot. What's the point? Because everything in the Bible is symbolic. The bird is Jesus. Okay? And Jesus came in an earthen vessel called a body. Right? He came to this earth, and by the way, he's like the, so why a bird? Because Jesus came from heaven, which is the domain of a bird. And he came to earth in, a, in an earthen vessel, a human body, and he died. But he was not like us. He was sinless and pure and clean, thus the continual running water on the bird. Do you see it? Then the priest would take a second live bird and he would take the blood of the first bird and he would take the second live bird and he would take cedar, the wood. He would take scarlet cloth and he would take um, hyssop, which is a plant and usually it would be a branch. He would take hyssop and he would collect these things together and dip it in the blood of the first bird. And then together somehow holding this together, would sprinkle the now cleansed leper seven times with the blood. Could you just imagine standing there, closing your eyes, splat, 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 seven times. Seven is the number of completion, see. How many you know when God does a work, he finishes it? He doesn't do anything halfway, see. And seven is, and so he splattered with the blood. He said, well, why would anybody want to go to church? And they take the blood of a bird and stand there and get sprinkled with blood. Because again, what was happening then was symbolic of the reality today. Who's the second bird? The second bird is the Holy Spirit. Because it is the Holy Spirit who came down like a dove upon Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit who goes and does what God wants. And it is the Holy Spirit who is involved directly when we are born again. We are born of the Spirit. When you get saved. So the bird is the Holy Spirit. The cedar represents the wood of the cross. The scarlet cloth represents our sins. David said, though your sin, or maybe as Isaiah said, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And then the hyssop represents cleansing. David said in a psalm, wash me with hyssop and I shall be clean. And then he sprinkled. So here's what it is. The Holy Spirit 
It's, it's just, it's the gospel. The Holy Spirit takes the blood of Jesus, right, through the work on the cross, and he applies it to our sins. And when he does, then there's cleansing that occurs, and all our sins are washed away, and we're made right with God. Is that powerful or what? And then, yeah, go ahead and praise him if you want to praise him. Think about it's, it's all types showing to Jesus and our salvation. And here's the last part. You know what the leper had to do? It's crazy. Read Leviticus. It's there. He was then required to shave all the hair off of his body. I'm talking about your eyebrows. Shave all your hair off your head, off your arms, your legs. You had to totally shave it. Now, why in the world? Who would want to go to a church where they make you shave everything? Right? I mean, we read the Bible, and we just kind of skim through stuff. But just think, that's what was supposed to happen to this leper. He's splattered with blood. And now he's supposed to strip down, they take a razor and shave every bit of hair off his head. You know why? Symbolism, one more time. Because you take the old things that were part of the old you, and you get rid of it. All things have passed away, and then you let new hair grow like a fresh start. If any man be in Christ or woman be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. And old things pass away. Behold, all things in your life, your, your speech, your thought process, your actions, how you treat people, how you react to people. Everything becomes brand spanking new. That's what the Bible says. And so that man walked around with every bit of hair shaved off. I'm, I, I, my age shows. It's like that old show. And I was a little kid. They had some show about kung, about kung fu. And that old guy's bald-headed, you know. And, and, and that's probably what he was walking around bald-headed. And, and here's the, you say, well, wasn't that, wasn't that weird? Well, maybe yes, but maybe no. Because the guy that had hair, everybody knew as the guy who was a leper. But when all the hair got shaved off and he walked around, people that used to know him would say, whoa, 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 come here. Come here. You, you look like Bill. You, what has happened to you? Where'd your hair go? When you get saved, people will look at you and say, hey, wait, 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 wait. you look like the guy I work with, every, but you're, there's something different about you. You're not, it's not the same what happened to you. And then you get to say, I'm so glad you asked. Let me tell you what the Lord has done for me. You don't want anything from the old you hanging on. You don't want anything. You don't want to talk the way you, I'm preaching holiness now. See, You don't want to talk the way you used to talk. You don't want to treat your spouse the way you used to treat them. You don't want to talk to your kids the way you used to talk to them. You're not going to chill, cheat and steal and cuss and do all the things like you used to do because something wonderful has happened in your life and God has changed you. And I know it didn't work this way because this song wasn't written in, but it's my sermon. Let me preach it. I think he was walking around and somebody said, hey, hey, you look, wait a minute, you look like Bill. You look, what, what happened to you? And I think he said, I'm so glad you asked. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Listen to me, pal. Something wonderful happened. And now I know. Oh, he touched me and made me whole. And the guy said, wait a minute. Who are you talking about? Oh, he said, all of it. Jesus touched me. Oh, Jesus touched me. And oh, the 
joy that floods my soul. Something wonderful happened. And now I know Jesus touched me and made me whole. Listen, when he touches you, you got to tell somebody what he's done in your life. Come on, stand with me all over this church.